Thank you so much for staying with First Issues. We continue our conversation with Chief Executive Officer at Botswana Oil, Mishak Tegedi. Our conversation today, its objective is not to, you know, talk about anything else outside of your mandate as Botswana Oil, but it would be very remiss of us to not touch a bit on my next question, which is, um, you know, there have been a few allegations um, around the alleged shortage of the ULP 93 fuel. Um, there's been allegations as well of contamination of water in this supply and you know the public and other suppliers are blaming Botswana oil for this unfortunate mishap. Um, perhaps at this point you could clarify exactly what has been going on. Thank you very much. So the first issue is on the availability of ULP 93. Uh, when we started on the 1st April it was the same month that one of the only place in the region where ULP-93 is manufactured at the Nedraf refinery in South Africa. They had built up some stocks to try and sell this over a period of the shutdown, which was meant to be April, May and June. The refinery shutdown was delayed to May. Uh, and was supposed to come up in June and they've had some challenges with the commissioning of the refinery after the shutdown, which means their stocks are reduced to critical levels. So when we go to June especially and July, there was limited stock of ULP-93 from this refinery. Obviously, they started a rushing in the ULP-93 across all the countries who consume the ULP-93. There are only a handful of countries who still consume ULP-93. This is Botswana, South Africa, uh, Lesotho, yes, in the region. Countries like Namibia, Mozambique, and Iswatini have discontinued the use of ULP-93 because it's made in one refinery in the region and this refinery does not produce enough even for South Africa so it's always rationed across the life uh, of the refinery even if it's fully um, running. The challenge is the ULP 93 can also not be imported anywhere else outside the region. If you import ULP 93 outside the region is blended fuel. It's either 91 that's upgraded or some other adulterated product. In reality as a country, we should not allow the importation of ULP-93 outside the region, which we know is blended fuel, which, whose quality we cannot guarantee. For example, the testing methods that we use in the country to test um, what is called the research octane number is not the methods. The methods cannot verify the octane number in the blended 93, which means the market will not be able to accept that fuel. Which means we are constrained in the importation of ULP 93 largely from the one refinery. And if they have a breakdown, or if they choose to close tomorrow, we want to have ULP-93. Yeah. We must come to the realization as consumers that the ULP-93 and 95, there's no difference. And ULP-95 is in any case a better fuel and will perform as good in any engine. Well, let us track back now to where we're actually here, the mandate of um, Botswana Oil. So perhaps, or maybe, um, you know, this is a very intricate industry. It's huge and the network is very diverse. So simplify it um, with three very basic things that 
you think your consumer or our viewers must understand? That's a very important uh, question. I think the first thing uh, is for consumers to understand that we import all our fuel requirements. We do not have a refinery in Botswana. And therefore, we are reliant on other countries for the supply of fuel in Botswana. We have to stand up and ensure there is fuel at all times in Botswana. And government has done well by ensuring that we have our destiny in our own hands. We import this critical commodity um, that is a key driver of economic activity in Botswana. That's very critical. And Botswana should also know it's not easy to set up a refinery. You know, I keep hearing, ah, why don't we set up a refinery? We can import crude oil. And, um, you know, why don't we set up a refinery? Big companies with deep pockets, with experience in the construction of refineries struggle to raise funding to build refineries. In addition, as we know, fossil fuels are increasingly coming under pressure uh, from um, environmental activists with respect to global warming. When you establish a new refinery now, you know that the requirements are onerous, environmental requirements are onerous to ensure uh, you keep the processes, not only the fuels, but the processes clean as well and we do not um, uh, pollute the environment. So it's not as easy as it sounds in the textbook that you can establish a refinery tomorrow. The other important thing uh, to know as a country is the pressure is on in terms of uh, environmental concerns about fossil fuels. We continuously work with international organizations to see what role we can play in the energy transition. As Botswana, well, for example, we are looking at um, the both manufacturing of uh, biofuels in Botswana, uh, which is biodiesel. We have been working with the ministry. The ministry has sponsored uh, research to establish what um, um, resources we have in terms of feedstocks and what blending ratios in collaboration with the University of Botswana um, that can be used for manufacture of, bio, of biodiesel. And as Botswana, well, we will be the market, we'll provide offtake to anybody that's able to establish uh, these plants. The Ministry has also been working towards the establishment of uh, biogas industry by funding the research as well as establishing quite a number of uh, uh, sites who use uh, biogas across Botswana. There is a program where there is funding uh, for biodigesters, which are the generators for the biogas um, rolled out across the, the country. While this is meant to seed and demonstrate the capability of um, biogas in Botswana, the intention is that citizens can now begin to procure these things for ourselves and use them in our homes and, 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 and in the institutions. So just a little bit about the energy transition that we are also working towards uh, increasing the opportunities in the biodiesels. And the idea is these have lower carbon footprint than the fossil fuels, bring them into, into our mix. There are other developments that will arise from the coal to liquid plant, such as lighter fuel, uh, lighter carbon fuels, for example, for the aviation industry, will also generate hydrogen, and that can also be infused into our fuel mix. Well, before we part, Ratakedi, is there anything that you feel we've left out in our conversation that you'd like to add? The last one that I didn't touch on is water contamination. Before our importation mandate, Botswana had been importing fuel into the country. So water content in fuel did not start with Botswana oil. Fuel is a hydrocarbon. Scientifically, all hydrocarbons absorb water. It's a case of what are the limits of water 
mm -hmm. in the liquid fuel hydro hydrocarbons. So they absorb water and any closed container vessel such as tankers, tanks, storage tanks will always uh, have water ingress or condensation and we the the infrastructure is built such that there is opportunities or capability to drain this water. So our fuel standards, including our engines, have the capability to handle minimum amount of water because water does dissolve and get suspended in fuel, whether diesel or, or, or petrol. In fact, you can drain water from fuel and still remains dissolved and suspended and you would not know about it. The important thing is, in terms of our testing methods in the country, we know these tolerances. We accept fuel on the minimum tolerances in instances where you find water. As an industry standard, when water is within these tolerances, you still drain it out and get on with utilizing the, the fuel.